helping to take NRP and um, helping make this great. So, Beers, you mentioned that I took two years off in between my residency and fellowship and spent time abroad. And I worked in this little town in Ecuador called Guadalupe. If you wanted to reach Guadalupe, you have to take a 15 hour bus ride from Quito, or you could take a puddle jumper plane to a town called Loja and then a five hour bus ride to Guadalupe, which is this picturesque town here along a river. And you can see that the clinic is on one side of the river and then um, the town on the other side. And people would walk for several miles or take the bus very early in the morning. So every morning when I woke up, I would see this line of people waiting outside the clinic to come and see me to buy what was called the feature or the ticket um, that gave them their appointment with me um, in the clinic. Now, I had the opportunity to follow a woman named Rosa for some of her antenatal care, and I kept telling her, when the time comes for you to deliver this baby, you need to go to the hospital because the care of pregnant women and babies and children under five is free in the hospital. And people were afraid of going to the hospital because of the quality of care that they had there. And so um, Rosa purposefully waited when she went into labor until the last bus of that evening had already come and gone. Um, the closest hospital was an hour and a half away by bus in a town called Zamora. And she waited until that last bus had come and gone and had her friends come and get me to say, Rosa's in labor, you need to come right now. And so for me, this was a life-changing moment in, in my career that, um, that made me realize that many women around the world deliver in these types of circumstances. Um, I luckily had a nurse at the clinic that accompanied me across that really hanging bridge that you saw crossing the river. I went into the town where Rosa lived in a one-room shack. This is one of two beds that was on, that was in uh, her home. She had already put a piece of plastic on the bed and she was intending that she would deliver her baby there. And in the other bed, she had two little children asleep. Now this was in 2003, this was before helping babies breathe. But knowing that I was going to go into neonatology, I knew that I needed to be prepared for the delivery. And I set up a place um, where I would receive the baby. And I told the nurse that when the baby comes, I'm going to bring the baby over here and assess and make sure the baby doesn't need resuscitation. And I want you to monitor Rosa and make sure that, you know, as the placenta is delivered, that you're, that you're monitoring that. And I will come back and help you once I know the baby's okay. And luckily, this story had a happy ending. You know, we ended up not trying to move Rosa because her contractions were too far apart. I didn't think she would, were, were too close together. Sorry, I didn't think she would make it across the hanging bridge where we could deliver her with the electricity in the clinic. We um, boiled water and made sure our equipment was sterile. And um, several hours later, this little baby girl was born. And luckily, um, I brought the baby over to the place that I had reserved for, for assessing her, and she cried. And Rosa did fine, and um, the, the story had a happy ending. <clears throat> now, in many places around the world, um, women do not name their babies right away because they die. And in Ecuador, I would see babies come into the clinic and they would be marked no name for several months. And um, around the time that this baby was five months old, I saw Rosa in the clinic and she was looking at my name on the door and she ended up naming the baby Bina. Um, and it was, it was sort of neat. There ended up being, I think, around like four Binas in, in, a, in the village and surrounding area over my time there. Um, and I had a chance to go back to Ecuador and see, see my friends in the clinic and, and also see um, baby Bina. Rosa calls me the baby's Madrina, meaning I'm, I'm her godmother. And but this, this incident really affected me and it affected the course of my career. Um, it was around that time that I had then gone to Australia that the Lancet Neonatal Survival Series was published in the um, was published in the Lancet. And it talked about uh, at that time four million babies dying in the first four weeks of life. And thankfully we have made progress since that time. Um, the facts are about 2.4 million babies dying in the first four weeks of life, which amounts to about 6,700 newborn deaths per day. And when we think about approximately 130 million babies born worldwide every year, um, over slightly over half of those are occurring in a home-based setting where it may be hard for mothers and their babies to um, have access to adequate health care um, during that very high risk time. 
And this um, graphic is a little bit old, but I like it because it clearly demonstrates the big three reasons that newborns die around the world. Um, and they are preterm birth, birth asphyxia, and infection. And so if we think about the reasons that babies die in our settings, you know, prematurity is up there, but also congenital anomalies would make the list. So there are some differences in causes of newborn death when we think about high and low resource settings. And when we think about the timing of neonatal death, there's no time at which a mother is more at risk of death or her infant than in that 24 hours surrounding birth. And so um, this is also a time where I told you that if these women are at home, they're at very high risk for mortality and may die without ever coming to the care of a medical professional. And um, in Ghana, where uh, Dr. Ramos and I are getting ready to head in, in a few weeks, they call some of these children the ghost children because they, they're never even registered that they even survived or lived for a time in the first place. And another big challenge is that 99% of these neonatal deaths occur in low and middle income countries, but yet most of our research focuses on the 1% of deaths that occur in high income countries. So there's this disparity as well in terms of the information and knowledge that we glean from why babies are dying around the world. There's also huge disparities in where these deaths occur um, by, by countries or regions around the world. So you can see by this graphic that the darker areas are areas with higher neonatal mortality rate. You can specifically see countries in sub-Saharan Africa, um, in countries in um, Asia that, that stand out um, in, in, in regards to that. But when we delve a little bit deeper, um, we'll see other disparities that exist, and I'll, and I'll go through that in a minute. But one of the things I also wanted to point out was that um, when we talk about our trends in neonatal mortality rate, we've made um, terrific inroads in low lowering under five mortality um, around the world with things like immunizations, um, antibiotics, um, treatments for diarrhea. And as we continue to make inroads in under five mortality, what we're seeing is that uh, overall neonatal mortality now makes up a larger proportion of overall under five mortality. So if we really want to meet some of our global goals for improving child mortality overall, we really have to take some specific time to focus on the newborn. And the um, Every Newborn Action Plan, which was published in 2017, attempts to do this. And this, this really spurred um, national neonatal um, programs and, and plans in countries that um, wanted to work globally towards the goal of um, having a national neonatal mortality rate of 10 or less by 2035, meaning that a global, there would be a global average of seven per thousand live births by the year 2035. I talked about disparities and these disparities, we, you know, we think of how much we have here in high resource settings, but we still have disparities. So when we look at different countries around the world and we compare the poorest and richest quintiles, we see those disparities that exist in terms of neonatal mortality. And it doesn't matter if you're in South America, um, you're in Asia, or you're in Africa, these findings persist um, among regions. And just to show some data from Cincinnati, where I spent a significant portion of my, of my career, Cincinnati is an urban area, has one of the largest infant mortality, highest infant mortality rates in the country. And so this um, community action collective called Cradle Cincinnati did work looking at infant mortality rate by zip code. And we're able to find um, differences by where people live um, that made them at higher risk for infant mortality. So these, these issues of equity persist not just globally, but also locally. And you add to all of that the impact of the pandemic. And when we think about the specific inroads that we've made towards reducing neonatal mortality, child mortality, increasing coverage of vaccination, increasing institutional delivery, and then bam, the pandemic hits. And we know that from the pandemic, 
Um, many children, 23 million children, did not get vaccinations like they should have gotten in the last year. And while the data from 2020 are still pending in terms of neonatal mortality, it's very concerning that these data are going to show that we have reversed decades of improvements um, towards improved neonatal care. So I want to talk a little bit about now this environment where the academy is working. So for those of you that are unaware, um, the mission of the AAP is to attain um, the optimal physical, mental, and social health and well-being for all infants, children, adolescents, and young adults. And we do this through three pillars, policy, advocacy and education. So many of you hopefully are aware of some of the policy statements. I think many pediatricians follow those policy statements for their clinical care. We also do a lot of advocacy. Um, we have a whole office in Washington, D.C. that focus on, focuses on lobbying for different causes that affect children. And many of you are probably aware of the courses and educational programs um, that we have um, uh, that educate our members and non-members about pediatric care. Now, in my team is specifically, we are the global health and life support team. I think a lot of people wonder, well, how do these two things that seem so disparate ever get put together? And I'm going to tell you a little bit more about that. But our team specifically is dedicated to fulfilling the mission of the academy, but with the emphasis on the all. It doesn't matter where you're born. It doesn't matter um, what country you live in, but this, this mission should be applied to all children. And we really pride ourselves on the clinical skills training programs, for example, NRP, the peer-to-peer -peer mentoring, the technical support, and the systems-based implementation that we do to accomplish this mission. So um, I know that you can't read everything on this slide, and I will go through a little bit more about our strategic plan and priorities, but this is just a picture of our um, three-year strategic plan. But our core values are to achieve excellence innovation and partnership and we um, are driven by the epidemiology of global child morbidity and mortality and this is our um, leadership team so some of you know dr janet patterson who is also a neonatologist she's our senior vice president of global child health and life support and has been at the academy about three and a half years having come to us from the gates foundation and then um, we have two directors, Carol Carver, who oversees our global child and adolescent health programs, and then Albert Jones, who oversees global business direct, um, development. And then underneath me, I have two directors that sort of address the two halves of my team. So one is Michelle Oleg Smith, who is a DNP and RN, and she is our director of simulation and clinical skills training. And then Maimuna Alex Adiomi, who is a um, Nigerian born um, physician who leads our neonatal global team and serves as the director of global training and implementation. So our four key goals for global child health and life support are to develop, implement, and research curriculum interventions designed to improve the quality of care for newborn children and adolescents. So this may involve leading implementation of the next generation of neonatal resuscitation training, for example, NRP and the new um, WHO um, Essential Newborn Care course, which AAP collaborated on. We also want to do this by supporting other professional societies to achieve sustainable independence. So that means we want to build infrastructure and collaborate with our sister pediatric societies around the world. We also want to provide AAP members with the skills and opportunities that they need to, to improve the health of children around the world. We want to make sure that our members who do global health work are equipped with the knowledge to do this in a sustainable and ethical way. And finally, we want to offer clinical skills training programs that are state of the art in science, learning methodology and technology. And so it's wonderful to hear some of our NRP steering committee members like Dr. Weiner and Dr. Dick Byrne, who you're going to hear from later today, um, who have exemplify um, this goal um, of, our, of our team. Just to tell you a little bit more about the work that our area does, so we have multiple clinical skills training programs, not just NRP. We also oversee um, PFACS, which is a pediatric first aid program geared towards families, neonatal, uh, not neonatal, uh, school nurses, um, other child caregivers. 
We have the advanced pediatric life support or apples. We have pediatric education um, for pre-hospital professionals or PEP. We have a babysitting course. We oversee three sections, the section on global health, the section on international medical graduates, and the section on simulation and innovative learning methods. We have that new area of global business development led by Albert Jones. And then we also have a number of grant programs for which we do the work in terms of developing curricula, doing research, and also doing implementation. And we don't do this work alone. And it's really important to show you that we have um, collaborators in all of the work that we do that go beyond pediatric societies, but also um, our um, multilateral organizations and, and um, non-governmental organizations that we collaborate with to do the work that we do. And I mentioned that we can run grants through the academy. So we can do this in a number of ways. The academy can um, apply for a grant or we can partner with one of our members and be a subcontract on a grant. And I highlighted in red the, the specific grants that are pertinent to our area and that um, are looking at um, issues related to neonatal resuscitation or essential newborn care. So I'll talk a little bit about what we're doing with digital tools for helping baby, babies breathe and, and essential care for every baby. I mentioned Dr. Ramos and I are getting ready to go to Ghana, um, where we're working on an initiative for strengthening neonatal intensive care. Um, because once you refer a baby to a NICU, you want to make sure there's high quality care that will enable that baby to survive once they are in the NICU. We also have a project with the um, cerebral with funding from the Cerebral Palsy Alliance to look at longer term outcomes related to neonatal resuscitation. Um, so following babies um, through six months of age and looking at neurodevelopment, and we're currently looking for funding to follow these babies a little bit longer and also validate some um, neurodevelopmental testing like the general movements assessments and also the new um, WHO. Um, uh, uh, tools to um, assess neurodevelopmental outcomes. So just to give you a quick snapshot, this is where our, um, we currently have a public health program. And obviously some of our work, this doesn't en encompass, for example, um, countries where our, our programs have touched like the scope or reach of NRP or helping babies breathe. These are just um, areas around the world where we currently have ongoing programs or partnerships. So in my area, which is the global newborn and child health team, I think of it as three areas, the clinical skills training component, the simulation component, and the neonatal global team. And it's in the realm of these three areas where we are working to improve and, and align our mission in terms of neonatal resuscitation around the world. So I want to go back and talk a little bit about NRP. NRP is really one of the first ways that the Academy got involved in global health work. NRP has been adapted in more than 124 countries and in 25 languages. And it's been done in a very ad hoc and unofficial way. You know, NRP is out there. People like come to the Academy and say, I want this book translated. I want to, you know, run my own program. And we've never had a very um, efficient or effective way to do this in an official in an official manner. And when we also look at the science for resuscitation at birth, we know that all babies require some sort of assessment by a skilled provider, but that not all babies are going to need advanced resuscitation. It's really a, a minority of babies, less than 1%, who are going to need intubation, chest compressions, or drugs. And, um, you know, we were talking about the um, uh, about um, tactile stimulation this morning. There's some evidence from Heggy Erzdahl, for example, that babies that are born in lower resource settings, um, slightly more of them will need stimulation than babies that are born in higher resource settings. But overall, the science of resuscitation would show us that for, if we were to develop a program of neonatal resuscitation for low resource settings, we really need to focus on the initial steps of res resuscitation and um, positive pressure ventilation. Um, we also know that in the background, there are um, these 1 million intrapartum stillbirths, 350,000 million maternal deaths. And in areas where improperly performed resuscitation um, exists, 
there's a high risk for um, the consequences of intrapartum related events of improperly performed resuscitation, and particularly babies born with um, neonatal um, encephalopathy, who then go on to survive and then become children and adults with long-term impairment in areas that are not well equipped to care for them. And so this is some, a circumstance that we really want to avoid. So Dr. Weiner's um, bold vision about masterful, masterful mm -hmm. performance of neonatal resuscitation and to me wherever a baby is born is something that we strive to achieve. So out of this landscape helping babies breathe was born and you can tell from the action plan here it's very pictorial it's based on the same evidence that ILCOR puts forth that we base NRP on but it specifically focuses on those initial steps of resuscitation um, drying, warming, stimulating, and assessing the baby and initiating positive pressure ventilation by one minute if the baby is not breathing on their own. And HPV's global reach has been um, nothing short of um, amazing. Uh, there have been um, almost 1 million birth attendants trained worldwide, and um, this has been the result of efforts through um, many partners. You can see the initial five partners of the Global Development Alliance that first um, uh, disseminated HPV. It's been translated into 27 languages and I think implemented in over 80 countries around the world. And last year, we were really proud to celebrate the 10 year anniversary of HPV, in addition to the 90 year anniversary of the AEP itself. And so we had a wonderful program at the, um, the virtual national conference and exhibition um, where we gathered and celebrated um, current research that um, that involved HPV. We heard from some of our um, initial HPV developers and we um, heard from some of our um, wonderful facilitators from low resource settings who have seen the impact that HPV has had on mothers and babies in those areas. Um, we also were able to hear, um, to, to, to celebrate and mark the 10th anniversary in other ways. So you can see here um, an oral history that was done with Bill Keenan, George Little, Susan Niermeyer, and Lily Sindal. Um, I had the privilege of interviewing them for an oral history that's kept in the archives of the academy and also a supplement in pediatrics, which celebrated multiple aspects of HPV from the educational methodology to its role at instigating um, quality improvement and innovation. And so I hope um, you take an opportunity to read some of the wonderful articles um, that Sarah Burkelhammer and Danielle Eric curated um, for this supplement. I think HPV taught us some important lessons, and this is a, a traditional birth attendant or community health worker in Gadshalomi, India, and she's the exact type of audience that, that HPV would be geared towards, and that the HPV taught us that it was possible to demystify a complex intervention and that neonatal resuscitation didn't only need to happen in a neonatal intensive care unit. It also taught us that behavioral change is hard to sustain. It's not hard to do trainings, but it's hard. The hard work really starts after training is over. And I think Dr. Weiner's talk um, exemplifies some of those challenges. And also that local implementation is key. So some of you are familiar with this formula for survival that um, when you're talking about survival after um, resuscitation, you really are talking about the, in, the, in, um, the uh, interaction between medical science, educational efficiency, and local implementation. And I'm proud to say that the Academy plays a role in all of these three areas to improve resuscitation. So, you know, you've heard a little bit about ILCOR and the, um, the neonatal writing groups that then um, help us produce products like NRP and PALS. AHA and AAP together co-brand NRP and PALS. And we're also really proud that now moving forward, both the pediatric and neonatal writing groups will be shared jointly by AAP and NRP with half of the members of each of those writing groups being AAP members and the um, scientific outputs of those groups being um, co-owned by, by both organizations. This is the same evidence, as I said, that programs like Helping Babies Bring are built on. So we're playing a role in supporting evidence generation. 
Um, we've used that, that relationship with AHA to also respond during the pandemic and come up with different um, guide, guidelines and guidance during the pandemic about how to best treat, um, teach a course and um, uh, um, guidance for um, how to do resuscitation during um, COVID. We are also in the process of working on um, international expansion for NRP and our new um, partnerships around the eighth edition of NRP, where, um, as many of you are probably familiar, our partner for the new learning management system is RQI Partners. RQI Partners is 50% AHA and 50% Laravel. And we are going to be utilizing the AHA International Training Centers um, as locations that can oversee the quality of um, the NRP program as we disseminate this worldwide. And um, some of the NRP steering committee members are involved in initial trainings in our phase one countries, um, the Middle East, which I know is not a country, but an area, Ireland and Hong Kong. So these are our first target areas for international expansion of NRP. I'm also really excited about um, a new initiative that we have at the Academy to also build more evidence about neonatal resuscitation called the DRIVE Network, which stands for the Delivery Room and Intervention Evaluation Network. And this has really been driven by Dr. Liz Foglia um, at CHOP. Um, we at the AAP are partnering with CHOP towards developing a multi-institutional um, research network with, with the six sites you can see below. Oklahoma is one of these sites. And we will be doing um, some basic epidemiology um, research about delivery room interventions, and hopefully par pairing that with measurement of physiologic data to really understand those initial res um, uh, resuscitation interventions, those basic resuscitation techniques, and how the baby responds. And so this is really exciting. We've got some um, C funding um, to start our data collection, which we're hoping to do by the end of the year. So this is another example of building that medical science um, evidence base towards our progress. Educational efficiency. So some of these um, uh, pictures you've seen from Dr. Weiner's talk, the Academy is um, venturing into virtual reality. You heard about the virtual reality program that we have for pediatric first responders. And you heard me talk about the PET program, which is pediatric education for um, pre-hospital professionals. For pre-hospital professionals, the pediatric call is one of the most scary calls that they can get. Um, they do not see these events frequently. And so when you think about them doing a course like PET every two years and not having a touch point in between to practice some of those skills, we were envisioning that the virtual reality um, program would enable them to do that low dose, high frequency practice that we talked about that was so integral to make making sure that in those critical life saving moments you can perform the skills that you need to do. And you've also heard um, Dr. Weiner talk about the RQI program which is the, the kiosk in the center. Um, and also we are working on building our clinical simulation program at the Academy. And I'm really excited that Michelle Olin Smith has joined our team. She is a simulation expert. She has already done some remarkable things, turning our simulation room. And you can see what it looked like in the top right corner where there was a lot of clutter. She cleaned it out. You can see the top left photo. And now you can see she's built two patient areas, which can be monitored from behind. Um, this um, mirror here. And we also have sim capture where um, we could do simulations at the academy and those could be viewed anywhere in the world. So we're really excited about expanding our simulation program and hopefully being a resource for our members, but also for the community to do some of the programs at the academy. So I hope the next time you're in the new headquarters, you'll come and visit um, and check out our new simulation workspace. Um, I also wanted to mention that we are at the point now where HPV is going through a transition. Um, because of its overwhelming success, the World Health Organization is now um, taking over the program and will be um, publishing it with their branding. And what this enables to happen is that there's a wider audience that HPV can reach. So you see that their action plans are markedly similar to the format of Healthy Baby Spring. There's ENC 1 and 2, which covers HBB and essential care for every baby. And similar to HBB, it's taught with a very um, uh, 
skills-based um, methodology that is very pictorial um, in terms of the action plan and simplified. We are also working on developing Essential Newborn Care Now, which takes the WHO ENC course, but puts it on a digital platform so that a, an online facilitator can facilitate the course, hopefully with the aid of an on-site or local facilitator who can really focus on the skills-based practice that we know make these courses so successful. So you heard me mention the Mia Natalie Live mannequin, which you see here um, pictured. So she's not filled with water. She's filled with technical mat um, materials that enable her to be um, connected to Bluetooth. And so from a Bluetooth, like a tablet, I can monitor how often my learners in Nepal are practicing. I can see as they do the four different scenarios and what kind of feedback they're getting as they're doing bad mass ventilation. Um, as we've been starting to implement this in Nigeria and Bangladesh through our funding with the Gates Foundation, we're seeing that a lot of our learners need help to not bag too fast and also position the airway correctly. And we're able to monitor all of this remotely. And this is and this is just a quick example of what some of the digital tools look like. So using QR codes to get to some of the assessments where the facilitator can oversee the performance of um, their learners. You can see that this facilitator can assess how those, um, that pair is practicing and give feedback in addition to the local, local facilitator that can also help oversee the skills-based practice. And we are currently working on a customized mentorship package. Um, we're calling it tentatively CRIS, the Customized Mentorship and Implementation Support Package, to address those behavioral and implementation and mentorship challenges that happen after training. So we're in the process of developing modules that will um, serve as a menu of items that a mentor could work on with their group of learners so that mentor would assess what those educational and implementation gaps are with their learners and have a menu of resources and modules to pick from to curate a curriculum for their specific learners to work on things like monitoring and evaluation, facilitator, facilitator development, um, quality improvement. And we had our first informational session this past week and had a number of um, interests specifically from um, our um, very skilled HPV facilitators in low resource settings, which was wonderful to see. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about Project ECHO from a different standpoint, which is that the ECHO methodology is also something that we're using to support implementation after um, training. We have numerous ECHO projects, which is a tele-mentoring methodology in an all-teach-all-learn fashion where um, we support training after HPV. So we've had an ECHO project with the Midwife Association of Zambia, where the AAP is an ECHO a pediatric super hub and is able to teach other organizations and entities to be um, ECHO hubs in and of themselves. So even after um, our ECHO project with Zambia ended, they were able to use that methodology during COVID to bring people together and, and quickly disseminate education about COVID um, to their learners. I want to talk briefly about global health education because we want to make sure that as we're disseminating our programs, we're doing it in a, in a sustainable and um, ethical way. And um, neonatal resuscitation is part of that. There is a huge need for global health education um, amongst our members. In, the, in a pediatric survey um, in 2017, a third of the respondents um, who are academy members expressed interest in global health, but 50% of them did not feel well prepared. So that's a potential interest of 11,000 of our members who are interested in global health. And this includes people at all ages of their career. You know, I went early in my career and went abroad, but there are others at the other end of the spectrum who are now interested in global health, in addition to a huge burgeoning interest from our trainees. I'm proud to say that we have our first global health education course um, that is a, a live virtual event on Saturday, November 13th, but it will start with some asynchronous learning this summer, and neonatal resuscitation plays a role in this course, so if, if anyone is interested, um, you'll get to hear from some of the experts in global health, and I encourage you to sign up. 
And then we also have a new course called GHERB, which is Global Health Education for Equity, Anti-Racism, and Decolonization. And decolonization um, is something that you've probably heard of um, in terms of analyzing those power differentials when you're going out to work in a global health setting. And um, there's actually a, a, an obstetric and neonatal case where a 23-week baby was delivered early because um, the local resident asked the visiting resident, what would happen to this baby in your setting? And the visiting resident said, oh, they would be delivered. And then this 23-week baby is born with no, with no ability um, for further care. And um, I have one last slide, which is to say that for anyone that is interested in um, collaborating or volunteering for all of this work that we're doing at the Academy, there is an, a volunteer network, and you can access it through the collaborate.aap.org site. And we have had luck in our area advertising the planning groups, the um, steering committees, and the projects that we're working on, asking our members who are interested in volunteering to do so. And it's also enabled us to make sure that we're hearing from members that we don't always hear from. Um, and it's been wonderful to meet some of our new members um, through this methodology. I'll stop there. Thank you. Wow, what a fantastic session. Oh my goodness, Academy, I didn't know that Academy is doing so, I knew that Academy is doing work, but it's just amazing. It's, I also wanted to take a moment and uh, acknowledge Academy for uh, partially sponsor of this program. And uh, we have been funded by Academy for this uh, Neon Services Symposium since its inauguration. So thank you so much for Academy. And I would like to just thank Academy. Let me introduce our panel discussion, uh, starting with uh, Dr. Carlos Ramos, as he comes forward on the stage. Uh, let me introduce him. Uh, Dr. Carlos Ramos is an SS Associate Professor of Pediatrics at the University of California, San Diego, uh, where he is the director of the newly created Pediatrics uh, Global Health Program. Um, in addition, he is a technical advisor for the Academy on the neonatal resuscitation and on small and sick babies care in the low resource settings. Currently, he is representing um, advanced neonatal care as uh, being Dr. Dr. Kamath Ren uh, Manson in Ghana and Madagascar. Furthermore, he is a member of the American Academy of Pediatrics Helping Baby Survive uh, Planning Group and uh, Health Volunteers Overseas Program at, um, in the steering committee. He is particularly interested in the medical education in low and middle income countries, uh, having help with the curriculum development and capacity building. In, the many in many countries, including Africa, Asia, and Latin America. It's my absolute pleasure to have you uh, on the stage for the discussion of this important topic. And uh, while we will wait for Dr. Singhal to come on the virtual platform, let me introduce Dr. Nalini Singhal. See, um, Dr. Singhal is the professor of pediatrics at the University of Calgary uh, at Alberta Children's Hospital in Canada. Uh, she, so her training was at All India, All India Institute of Medical Sciences, um, um, and then she completed her pediatric residency and neonatology fellowship at Foothills Medical Center at Calgary. She has been uh, very focused and interested in global health. Uh, she has contributed uh, to the greater understanding of the neonatal resuscitation program development and its impl implementation, not only locally, but also globally, including the low resource uh, settings. She is a substantial uh, contributor to the neonatal resuscitation program and a member of a neonatal delegation of the International Liaison Committee on Resuscitation. Uh, she has been honored with the humanitarian award for the Global Health Initiative in 2013. We are honored to have her as well on this panel discussion. Thank you for, for coming and uh, discussing about this. So um, while we get started, uh, uh, let me just uh, ask uh, Dr. Karma Fran, Dr. Carlos, and Dr. Singhal to just en like enlighten us about the about like how, how, how just get us through this like visualizing this that how do you do this in low resource environment? How do you implement? How do you innovate? How do you uh, what, what are the how do you build the capacity? How do you how do you do this? Uh, can can you share with us? I don't know if you want me to go first, but uh, you know, it's, it's an honor to be here and uh, 
And honestly, you know, about my career, I've been fortunate that I've been able to participate in so many initiatives and now, you know, working with the academy and so many more and hopefully to, you know, improve the health and well-being of babies in the world. I would say that the most important first step is the local partnership. You know, we can, God knows that I have made so many mistakes in growing health, probably all the mistakes that we have to make I have made. Um, and one of the mistakes is to think that you're going to, you know, show up in uh, Guadalupe and, uh, uh, with your equipment, with your team, and you're going to provide, you know, 100, you know, visits to 100 babies, and then you want to leave, and you think that you have made an improvement in the health of the, of the community, and that's not true. Um, we really need to um, have a partnership that is, you know, local, that is interested in what we're doing, that has buy-in and believe in what we're doing, because uh, to me, um, that would be the most important first step. I could not agree more. And I, you know, I think some people might be asking why I brought up something like G Herd and what that has to do with what we're talking about. So G Herd, the Global Health Education for Equity, um, Anti-Racism and Decolonization, I think brings up, for example, how you start with those partnerships and you're doing it in a bi-directional way that there, there isn't that power differential. If we were to go into a place and you know the 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 philosophy that we use is we're trying to build the infrastructure of our sister organizations or pediatric societies as we're doing this work. So it's not just expansion or um, or uh, you know implementation out in the world for the sake of doing it. It's about um, lifting each other up and making sure that we're in this journey together to provide the best care that we can for mothers and babies. And so that partnership is really key um, to all of the work that we do. Um, Nalini, I don't know if you have other things to say. You've been doing this far longer than I have. I agree with what both of you have said. The only thing I'd like to add a little bit is uh, the governments in these different countries are getting a little more concerned about education because that's what we've emphasized over the last 25 years and would like to see global partners do more in terms of actually hands-on implementation. That's number one. And number two, the thing is that you can't go into a country and expect you to know what you're gonna do. I mean, even if I go into India where I grew up, I'd have no idea what to do in a specific district hospital. So you, we need academy members to be constantly arranging virtual uh, meetings with the local partners on an ongoing basis so that they know that they can trust you and you're there and you're there to understand their needs and work with them. And I think that's a shift that is gradually happening, uh, but I think it'll be important to emphasize that for people starting off in global health, that it's not a one time you can go to a country do something and leave. If you're going to one country, stay with that country, stay for a long time uh, to do things. I would, I would take that even a little bit further and say, you know, one of the things that, for example, I can um, give an example of our um, immunization program. So we do a lot of immunization advocacy through the academy, not just here in the US, but also worldwide. And one of the things that we have is an advocacy workshop that we use to train members of other pediatric societies, how they advocate with their ministries of health and their governments in regards to vaccines. So teaching them a skill like that where they who understand the local context can continue to advocate with their own ministry of health and their own government is a really important way to continue some of this work. Because we will be successful if we can start backing away and they're the ones that are doing that advocacy and training and sustaining their own programs. Well, couldn't I agree with that more. And I would like to add more about what Aline just said. You know, you need to know the environment of care where you're going to be working at. Because uh, we were talking earlier about an example, and it's not related to, I mean, it's related to us too, but many of you are probably familiar with the ACT study that look at the anti steroids in babies in low middle income countries. They, were, they look at almost 100,000 babies, they look, they look at six countries. And 
what did they find? That using anterior corticosteroids after 34 weeks or in the bigger babies actually increased mortality by 12%. So meaning that just because it works in our environment doesn't mean that it's going to work elsewhere. And that's something that is really important to know. I think conversely, there's also lessons that we have learned from low resource settings that we've adapted into our practices. So things like delayed cord clamping, which was extensively studied and advocated for in areas of South America. And also, um, many of you are probably familiar with the new um, the IKMC study that was published in the New England Journal of Medicine, which showed that for, for some of the smaller sick babies in some of our lower resource settings that, that had zero separation with their mothers, um, had better uh, um, survival rates. And so I think those are also lessons that we can learn from some of our lower resource colleagues who are doing wonderful work that might also shine a light on some things that we can improve here in this country. Yes, I think that's very relevant. And I, I do wonder to Dr. Escobedo always tells me that some many of us doesn't don't know that the adaptation of the educational program and equipment in the low resource settings actually help us to advance the science in all over the world, including states. So I you just what, what you just mentioned, I wanted to uh, highlight this that probably we don't know some of these things are actually coming. The science actually science is also coming from how you adapt. To the low resource environment and it actually integrated into the neonatal research and programs and so on. So I I really uh, was intrigued by that that uh, is it really not only the mortality but also the some of the innovative science innovation comes from this uh, this environments. Dr. Escobedo, you wanted to add um, or you want to say? Well, actually, I was going to ask another question, but uh, I see Nalini smiling, so she may want to say something about uh, the contribution from. Uh, from the lower resource areas to uh, advancing neonatology, neonatal resuscitation in the, in the developed world. Uh, I think well, what I wanted to say was, you know, when you look at the gap, uh, and it is a, at least a 80 20 gap of research being done, we have to look at whether we want to call it reverse innovation or whatever we want to call it, doesn't matter. Use uh, you know, Bina said cord clamping, but the one that I really want to emphasize is the use of oxygen. The fact that we've decreased the use of oxygen and use room air for resuscitation came from a need in the in the low resource settings. But the moment we talk like that, then we're not doing due respect or paying due respect to our partners in developing countries. I think we've got to, if we can possibly move ourselves to an equal position, we're doing research, we're looking at different environments and we're learning from each other, we'd be much, much better off and we'd get a lot more done and we'd get a lot more buy-in from our colleagues uh, around the world. They look at, uh, and. I'm a Canadian, so it's a little easier for me to say that. But when you go from North America, they look at you and think, oh, another American. They're gonna tell us what to do. Well, no, we're here to learn. And if I can, if nothing, if uh, from Bina's talk, we can all take that back, that it's an equal partnership, I would be delighted. That's why I was smiling, Marilyn. Thank you, thank you. Well, I was going to ask, Bina and all of you, um, that, you know, I remember 1987 and uh, that goal to have a trained provider at the, at the birth of every baby in the country, in our country. But now, what, 35 years later or so, um, where's our goal for a trained provider at every birth around the world? And what difference could that make? Now, you, Bina, you quoted some of the, the, the number of deaths. How many of those do you think are preventable if we actually had the, the, the goal of a trained provider, no matter what their level uh, of expertise is or professional uh, training, but uh, what, what difference would that make? That is a very complex question. I think at a, at a simple level, our instinctual response is, of course, we want a skilled 
and masterfully trained provider um, at every delivery. But in some lower resource settings, that's the, the answer is more complex. So um, for example, where are those trained providers located? So in some settings, they're located in hospitals. And when people go to hospitals, sometimes they don't find the best quality of care. So that's part of the reason that Carlos and I are working in Ghana, because they taught HPV and they got people referred and transferred to higher levels of care. But then when they got to those higher levels of care, it didn't move the mark on median and mortality because the quality of care that was in those hospitals wasn't where it should be. There are also some governments that, for example, knowing that deliveries happen in home-based settings, um, they, they also will not recognize, for example, traditional birth attendants who do some of those deliveries in home-based settings. And um, HPV, I think, um, while there is some evidence to show that it has it can improve um, behaviorals and resuscitation practices of traditional birth attendants, that has been an audience that has been harder to reach. So HPV, there's a lot of success to celebrate, but I think there are also things that we can learn as we continue to push the envelope now as we transition into the WHO and C program. I think another challenge are um, settings that are fragile or those humanitarian settings. Um, one of the places where we're hoping to test um, the virtual um, HPV or the ENC Now program is in Cox's Bazaar in Bangladesh. And um, right now, COVID has been pre preventing us from um, really getting our training underway there. But I think there's more that we could do to push the envelope in, you know, also those humanitarian fragile settings. But we, we continue to have that goal that we want in every delivery to be a skilled person available. Dr. Kasa has a question. Can I make a comment on the Maryland's question? Yes, yes, yes Dr. Uh, Singhal, please go ahead. Yeah, there are 2.5 million deaths right now, Maryland, of newborns. We brought it down from 4.5 million in the world. And the estimate is that about 600,000 of those you can save by doing KMC. And you can save another 600,000 by trained providers. That's the WHO's estimate. So the WHO estimate is if you do KMC and proper resuscitation and care at birth, you can have those births down to uh, deaths down to 1.2 million. And in, the, in addition, that will also save stillbirths. And they really don't have an estimate right now of how many of those stillbirths that they could save by uh, resuscitation. Thanks. Great, great change. Yeah, really great change. Uh, my question is uh, from the Shasi, uh, in addition to providing education and uh, 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 making the uh, uh, child providers or midwives cooking them with the skill, um, the global health is helping like this research and advancing science in developed countries. Um, a couple of decades ago, the main global health issue was HIVs and uh, studying like, you know, the maternal child transmission. And a lot of data came from Africa and South Asia. And when you look back to those studies, there were some controversies and issues. And now when we do research like the neonatal resuscitation in European countries, we do encounter big health issues. How do you try to avoid them? Well, Bina says something very important. Uh, we need to decolonize medicine. And that's really the, the bottom line here. You know, there is not a monopoly of knowledge just because we are in the developed north versus the underdeveloped south, if you want to call it like that. And uh, you know, I think we have learned from our mistakes, as I said in the past. I'm, I'm not saying that that's not happening anymore. But there is a lot of uh, um, emphasis on uh, the ethics of research, the quality of the research, uh, besides the you know improving the quality of care. Um, I have encountered situations still where um, you know the IRB approval is a little easy, um, and uh, people still are attempting to do um, studies in situations that we will never let them do it here. But little by little, we are really learning how to 
as I said, decolonize our approach to medicine. Our collaboration has to be bi-directional and even beyond equal, we have to strive for parity. So the same resources, the same ethical standard that we have here in Oklahoma City, they will have in uh, Calgary, that they will have in, uh, you know, in Illinois, we should have in Tanzania, in Ghana, and why not? You know, I went into, into global health because I really want, I really would like that if a baby is born in Oklahoma City, that baby should have the same opportunities to grow and develop and become the best human being that he can, even if that baby is born in uh, rural Ethiopia. And it's a, it's, it's a lot of work. Um, and I think that, that we're still uh, you know, at the beginning, baby steps, but I think the baby steps are in the right direction. Um, thanks for a great presentation. This is a, such an important topic. It's like the biggest topic we need to talk about today. Um, I, I, I just think of the implementation piece of this, and I perceive that there is a gap in our ability to train facilitators and mentors. So it isn't that our educational tools aren't amazing and wonderful, but whether you talk about NLP in Canada or whether you talk about talking baby food in any country, the gap seems to be in facilitation capacity, educational facilitation capacity. So we can create beautiful programs, but somehow getting them to promote us and maintain them is the issue. I don't know whether you have a comment about I think that's a very important comment, you know, especially as HPV has grown and our understanding of, of lessons learned and that, that the behavioral change that happens after the workshop is really the more important piece than the training itself. It's really meant that facilitators are not just instructors during the workshop, but they're also that supportive supervision, the cheerleader, the QI coach, and all of these lying in one person after the, the, the course, the workshop happens. And so how do we best develop those types of tools to um, enable those individuals to do that, that in, incredibly daunting job? And, you know, so one of the things that we're thinking about with this mentorship package that we're trying to develop is, um, you know, I, I can tell you from experience that for me, it was being around another mentor. So the first time that I trained HPV, I was with, you know, Susan Niermeyer, one of my mentors. And the more that I did trainings with her, I saw how she handled questions and how she utilized the educational methodology. Those were things that I incorporated into my practice. And then I became the mentor for somebody else. And so I think what this package enables people to do is have a longer relationship with a mentor over you know a six month period over numerous sessions where they can be supported for a longer period of time and that that mentorship relationship doesn't end right after the training course is over and it may not be perfect but i think it's starting to get us to where we need to go the other thing is you know gary alluded to the fact that we have technology now that um that will allow us oversight on different things. And so I think the role of the instructor, the, the skill set and the things that they're gonna oversee are changing. So we have some automated ways to determine how fast someone's bagging, if they're using the right pressure, if they need to change the airway. We can automate some of those things, which frees up the facilitator and instructor to focus on, on some of those other things that are gonna be harder to automate. And so that's, that's my two cents on it. I know you. You're very quiet. <laughs> no, I'm listening. I have a different. I have a question. Can Can you, Bina, if you had to pick three things that you think will help us meet the goal of getting the neonatal mortality to where we want it by 2030, and that's also one of the things in the chat box somebody asked, what would you pick? Three things. That's all we we can't do. A hundred things. Oops. <laughs> I think um, I see quality improvement as a very important uh, piece of, of what we need to work on. I think the relationships with um, local governments and ministries of health, and um, 
and I think the development of those facilitators and mentors. I think we have wonderful training programs and curricula, but I see the gaps right now in being those pieces that support those after training activities. We have some questions from the live audience and virtual chat. Look, uh, wise. Yes, there are several questions in the chat about. Um, can you describe more about the opportunities for volunteer work and then also um, the logistics of becoming a volunteer? Do we need to worry about licensure type issues when we're in a, a different country? So oftentimes when we're when our volunteers are going to a different country, they're not doing clinical care, which may involve a licensure in, in different areas. We're, we're mostly collaborating and building infrastructure with our in-country partners and really setting them up to be the, you know, the owners of a certain program. And so um, there isn't really a licensure issue. I would hope that people would be interested in taking courses like GHEC, the Global Health Education Course, and GHER, the Global Health Education for Equity, Anti-Racism, and Decolonization. Because, um, for example, GHER will make you self-reflect on why, why do you want to go to a global health setting? And, you know, this is a journey that I had to think through, for example, when I was a pediatric, you know, just graduated pediatric resident. Why did I want to go to Ecuador then? What did I think I had to offer? And what do I have to offer now? Why do I continue to want to do this work? And I think those answers might be different at different stages in our lives, but I think it plays into how we treat people and what our relationships that we're going to build are, are going to be. And so I think that journey is really important to go on if you, you know, for all of us now going on that journey for anti-racism, but I think also for global health practitioners. Um, in terms of volunteering, um, you know, whenever there are openings on any of our planning groups, we have used the volunteer network. We, we posted the opening um, for the NRP steering committee when there was an opening last year. We've posted openings for the Helping Baby Survive Planning Group. Um, when we've, we just posted an opening um, uh, for a new virtual reality anti-racism program that we're going to be putting on. And we've gotten like 50 volunteers for you know, the anti-racism VR program. And it's really enabled me to see what amazing and skilled members we have at the academy, some of whom I didn't even know, um, but now see these amazing skill sets that we have to choose from when we're building a diverse committee. I do have a couple of follow-up uh, uh, questions uh, or comments, um, and Dr. Singhal can also shine the light in this one. One is like uh, we are living in COVID era right now, and uh, you a little bit touch uh, on your presentation about uh, tele education. Um, how is the availability of technology uh, in the lower uh, settings? I know it's a heterogeneous population. We are talking about a lot of uh, uh, different uh, uh, lower resource settings, uh, but what we are moving towards in next decade or so. And the second thing is about. Um, what is the, we talked about this, me and Dr. Ramos talked about earlier about the equipment, probability, and how do we empower the frontline workers in the, this law, other than training, uh, not only by the education, but also by the equipment. Uh, um, so Dr. Singhal or anybody wants to take on this. <laughs> Bina, do you want to go first? Okay. Uh, okay. Uh, equipment, I think, uh, the governments amazingly are willing to spend some monies if you're really not looking at a lot of expensive equipment. And I think to actually have an impact on neonatal mortality, uh, initially, we don't need a lot of equipment. We need some equipment. What we need is we don't, we, we're not very good at getting people to learn how to keep the equipment safe and clean. And so what they end up with is even with the bag and mask, they end up not keeping it clean and infecting babies. So that's why I think uh, programs are more important than just uh, education. And what was the first one you asked, uh, Bridger? About technology, technological okay. involvement in the- uh, Technology uh, actually, surprisingly in the hospitals is not bad. So when I've done now, I've done sessions every day, every week, sort of at least two sessions with different countries on different things. They, you have to do them sometimes at an inconvenient time in North America because they can only get Zoom links in the hospital. Their individuals are not as good 
And if you get, want to get down to the villages, the answer is no. So you're really looking at what we would call a district level or a, a hospital environment where the technology is there. I don't know if Bina has a different experience or Carlos does, that's my experience. I think I would agree with you, Nalini. You know, the, we're, we are learning a lot with this BNC Now program. It's not as simple as just turning on a Zoom and starting to teach. There is a lot that goes into it. I know that um, Sarah Burkelhammer and Rachel Warren are looking at um, data usage as we're rolling out these programs. And so there will likely be more to come from them. Um, how we can support doing um, online training with things like communities of learning with WhatsApp groups and things like that. Um, you know, I think there, the, the technology that also enables us to do training in a different way. I think many of us are used to those HPE workshops where you go to a facility and it's a one to two day course because the trainers that are traveling there are there for a discrete amount of time. And what the digital technologies allow us to do are to do training a lot like Dr. Weiner discussed earlier in a distributed fashion where people could maybe do the, um, the gray zone and then take a break and let it settle in and practice and then come back a few weeks later and do the green zone. So I think COVID has allowed us to innovate and just because COVID will hopefully someday be over doesn't mean we're going to go back to the way things were. I think digital technology and innovation is here to stay. We just have to figure out the best ways to harness it and use it to our advantage. Can I say something that we have sure. time for you? Uh, it's just, a, just a, a little question for everybody. I mean, uh, as Bina said, I mean, the trainings are the easy part. I mean, translating the training to the bedside, if I want to use translation and science, so that, that's the complicated part. I mean, you know that the study from Erso, they look at 3,000 births, and then uh, they basically the time to implement biomass integration increase after training. And, uh, and as you rightly said, you know, there mortality right now is 49% of the under five mortality. And uh, despite having trained a million providers on HPV, uh, the new neonatal mortality at seven days hasn't improved, neither at 28 days, only the first day in some of the stillbirth. So then, uh, so then how do we do that? And I think I think the mentorship program is, a, is an excellent first step. I mean, are we gonna be available when there's a clinical question? We all are, we all are in our training. We all train our residents and fellows, but then after the energy training, I go to a delivery and I see things are not happening the right way. And that happens to us. So let us say in a low resource setting. So how, how do we do that? So I'm definitely taking home a couple of points that uh, we need to train more people and we need to empower the frontline workers uh, to affect the mortality. We have a lot of more to do and academy is uh, having big force and uh, we would we would hope to continue to improve the neonatal mortality throughout the globe. Um, let me join in thanking our, our speaker and discussion. We will take a break and we will see you in uh, probably 20, yeah, and, uh, 20 minutes. Yeah.